Today I'm talking about Joseph Wright of Derby. He's probably best known for his starkly lit interiors, but I hope to show you today that um, he was also a very um, a competent portrait and landscape painter, and one of the most successful artists in Britain in the 18th century. So let's have a look at um, his early life. He was born into a solid middle-class family. His father was a lawyer, well off, but not wealthy. Uh, but he could fund his uh, son travelling to London when he was just 17 to study under what was then a very well-known portrait painter, Thomas Hudson, who was the master of Joshua Reynolds, who became, of course, the president of the Royal Academy. He, Joseph Wright of Derby, painted this self-portrait when he was 19. It's his earliest known work, and it shows his mastery of portraiture and he knows it. The clothes he's wearing tell a story. They're not fashionable at the time this was painted, but they're a reminder of the types of clothes worn in Van Dyck's painting. Now, Anthony Van Dyck was, and, and still is, regarded as one of the foremost portrait painters who's ever painted in Britain. So Wright is showing his confidence and his ability it shows a young man full of determination and hints at his future success. Now, in 1753, he's settled in Derby, painting portraits of the leading figures of the town. And he was just 19, but he was already so accomplished that um, the mayor of Derby and his wife, we see here, Thomas and Anne Borrow, um, commissioned him to paint their portrait and he made most of his money painting portraits like this but like Thomas Gainsborough his first love was landscape. Also the type of painting that he's perhaps best known for in which he distinguished himself painting these subjects under strong artificial light and this type of painting wasn't unique to Wright. It was um, a popular type of painting at the time, but Wright became a leading, if not the leading exponent of this um, popular subject matter. And this is an example. This is his first masterpiece, which he painted when he was 32. It helped to solidify his place amongst the respected artists of the time. What we see is um, a scientific demonstration illustrating Wright's interest in science and technology. And it's called, uh, in brief, it's called the orrery, which is a mechanical model of the solar system. Now, Wright's neighbour in Derby was a clockmaker and he sold tickets for a lecture given by James Ferguson, a Scottish scientist. And these, this type of lecture was very popular at the time and a mixed clientele attended. Now Ferguson had published a book on mechanics and optics and he would illustrate his lectures using a variety of machines and instruments. And this painting was bought by the 5th Earl Ferrers who was an amateur astronomer who also owned an orrery himself. We don't know who the figures are. We don't think that it's James Ferguson that um, is being illustrated here. But the man taking notes on the left, we think, was a friend of Wright. And it's been suggested that Earl Ferrers, who bought it, and his nephew are included in the painting, perhaps on the right. And the, the philosopher who's giving the lecture in the centre... Uh, could be based on the appearance of Sir Isaac Newton, who died some 40 years before. But it was his um, law of universal gravity that um, unified the terrestrial and celestial worlds. Wright, in fact, with paintings like this, became the first painter to represent the modern world. And he used this... Uh, clever lighting to capture the excitement of the age 
and the interest of both the young and the old in science. Another science experience, another starkly lit interior, and this, in fact, an experiment on a bird in the air pump, has become one of his best known works. What we can see at the centre top of the painting is a white bird in a bell jar, and the scientist is pumping the air out of the bell jar, waiting until the bird has collapsed and then flooding the bell jar with air again and bringing it back to life, showing science's power over life and death, apparently. It has been described as one of the wholly original masterpieces of British art. And at the time, the gazetteer reviewed this painting and singled it out as Mr. Wright of Derby is a very great and uncommon genius in a peculiar way. Now, air pumps like this were relatively common and were used by these itinerant lecturers in natural philosophy who used to tour the country entertaining audiences in town halls and, and in wealthy people's homes. And the person I mentioned previously, James Ferguson, the Scottish astronomer, who was probably a friend of Wright, uh, was one of those um, natural philosophers. And typically, they didn't use a bird. They used a small bladder to simulate the lungs of a live animal because it was regarded as too shocking to every spectator who has the least degree of humanity, to quote from a critic at the time. Also, Wright is showing a white cockatoo and um, we seem to be being asked to judge by the philosopher whether the pumping should continue, killing the bird, or whether the air should be replaced, saving its life. And the boy on the right, the boy on the far right at the back, is either lowering the cage um, or, or raising the cage or, or it's been suggested he might be drawing the curtain to block out the full moon. In fact we have sketches of this produced by Wright where the lecturer is reassuring the girls in the painting that the bird does survive and to top all of that the cockatoo was actually a rare bird and to quote from someone at the time uh, one whose life would never in reality have been risked in an experiment such as this. So what we see here is something that has been constructed to by right to add to the tension rather than an exact representation of a typical experiment at the time. Incidentally, I mentioned the full moon outside the window, which suggests the Lunar Society. The Lunar Society was a um, society of friends that met every full moon, and I'll talk more about it later. It's, uh, it was an important society at the time. In terms of how much did these sell for, this painting, un unusually for the time, was painted without a commission, and then on, on the hope, Wright's hope, that he could sell it. And he asked... Um, initially £200, in fact in another place £210, and he got interest from a Dr Benjamin Bates, a, um, a well-known physician at the time, who offered him £130. And what Wright did, we know from his diary, that he, he wrote to him, saying that that sort of price was too low and it might much injure me in the future sale of my pictures. So, when I send you a receipt for the money, I shall acknowledge a greater sum. So in other words, there's a sort of bit of deceit here. The £200 or around £200 was what Wright would expect to sell these paintings for. Bates didn't want to pay that much. 
he didn't have any other buyer, so he sold it to him for a less amount, but sent him a receipt for the, the full amount so that he could claim to uh, later purchasers that um, £200 was the typical amount he received for these paintings. We don't actually know how much Bates actually paid because the only record we have from Wright's account book is that he received £30 in part payment. We, we don't know whether he received the remaining £100. The Alchemist Discovering Phosphorus. We believe this is um, a depiction of the German alchemist Hennig Brandt who discovered phosphorus in the 17th century. Now, unusually, the interior is not a typical um, laboratory. It's a Gothic church. And this was a period when modern chemistry, as it was practiced when Wright was painting, was emerging a hundred years previously, from ancient alchemy. So we believe that Brandt was probably trying to discover the Philosopher's Stone, that is a process for turning base metals into gold. And instead, to his amazement, he's discovered phosphorus. Incidentally, Wright has idealised the process which um, at the time involved boiling down some 50 to 60 buckets of urine. Now, to the educated viewer at the time, this painting concer raised concerns, and in fact it wasn't sold. Phosphorus was known as the devil's element, and this religious Gothic church setting and the magical lighting all conflicted with what was understood at Wright's time as the rational process of chemical research. And so this painting disturbed 18th century viewers, and in fact it didn't sell until after Wright's death. The blacksmith's shop. Now this is a typical blacksmith shop at the time. Writers captured a scene from everyday life, in other words. Um, but it was a very unusual subject to paint at the time. In, in other words, painting a scene from everyday life wasn't a typical subject to paint in the 18th century. And Wright painted five variations on the theme of the blacksmith shop. Here, he's celebrating the, the dignity of human labour. We can see uh, there's two um, hammers being used alternately to beat the um, red-hot iron. Whereas in this painting, the Iron Forge, we see a celebration of technology. The hammer was lifted and dropped constantly by water power and the arrangement such as this would have been um, expensive and not typical, not affordable by the typical blacksmith, or, although uh, widely used, but um, a representation of uh, a, um, a special uh, sort of technology used in certain places in the country. The blacksmith is showing off his new investment to his family, who must have been deafened by the noise. Interestingly, the area of South East England, known as the Weald, which is Kent, Sussex and parts of Surrey and Hampshire, was and has been um, a major iron producing region since before the Romans arrived. It, it no longer is. Um, so it's been or was an iron producing region for over 2000 years. Rivers were dammed to create hammer ponds and then these ponds, the water flowing from these ponds, was used to power these heavy hammers that would operate all day long. So what is now a tranquil countryside must then have echoed with the noise of multiple hammers constantly crashing down with the smoke from the furnaces 
countless workers, roads full of carts carrying iron, wood and charcoal and so on. Uh, very different from the way it is today. A quiet, peaceful countryside. This is um, another painting of an iron forge viewed from the outside. A water-powered uh, hammer we see again. Uh, but this time it's a moonlit scene. This painting is actually in the Hermitage. Now, the moon reminds me that I was going to mention the Lunar Society again. And it was a society that Wright wasn't actually a member of the society, but he knew most of the members. He was closely connected. Members uh, were typically scientists and um, industrialists and included Erasmus Darwin, who was Charles Darwin's grandfather, Matthew Bolton, who, with James Watt, invented and sold the steam engines used to power the Industrial Revolution, the author and anti-slavery campaigner Thomas Day, uh, Joseph Priestley, the chemist, and the potter and abolitionist Josiah Wedgwood. Wedgwood. Now, not all his scenes were science and technology. This is Academy Loved by Lamplight, an imaginary art academy where a group of students are gathered round a plaster cast of the uh, Hellenistic sculpture Nymph with a Shell, which is now in the Louvre. It was believed at the time that this contemplation of art like this was civilising activity which would make the person more virtuous and calm down the rough and aggressive masculinity which is represented here by the another Hellenistic statue, the Borghese Gladiator, which we can see in the background on the right. This painting is now in the Yale Centre for British Art. Now, by 1773, when he was 39, he was by then an established and internationally known artist. And he married Anne Swift, who was the daughter of um, Derbyshire Minor, and they set off for Italy. Uh, she was pregnant and they went to Italy with two of his, accompanied with two of his friends, and they spent some time in Naples. And this is a um, cavern near Naples, um, one of a series of paintings of, that he made in the Gulf of Salerno. The, the, each of the paintings in the series, it's a series of four, captures light at a different time of day. And the paintings reflect the romantic fascination with landscape and right sense of awe and reverence for nat nature's beauty. Also when he was in Naples, although he never actually witnessed a major eruption of Vesuvius, he did see minor eruptions and he's used those sketches to create this imaginary, um, what's called eruption of Vesuvius 1771 seen from Portico. It illustrates or demonstrates the sublime. About 20 years before he visited Italy, Edmund Burke had published a book called A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, which was um, an analysis of what we mean by the sublime and the beautiful and comparing and contrasting the two. And this provided a sort of rom a theoretical basis for the Romantics to approach the world um, based on, with the sublime, based on their feelings of awe towards the world and the, the power of nature and the way that at any minute nature can overwhelm us and the the terrifying effects of storms, avalanches and natural events like volcanic eruptions. 
it was in the Romantic movement was in a sort of contrast with the Age of Enlightenment, where everything was reduced to uh, reason, and the Romantics saw that this was too limited and introduced individual feelings in addition to reason and logic. Now, on his return from Italy, he set up as a portrait painter initially in the very fashionable town of Bath, but he was dissatisfied, didn't get enough work there, wasn't happy there, and returned to Derby in 1777 and spent the rest of his life in Derby. Now, this is a portrait of the industrialist and inventor Richard Arkwright, a leading figure in the Industrial Revolution, and in fact the first to open factories to mechanise the cotton industry, which de-skilled weaving and enabled him to employ women and children to carry out the work. He's painted here as um, a noble figure, highlighting his status in society, and the Industrial Revolution gave rise to a new wealthy middle class of industrialists like Arkwright, who were to take over from the landed gentry as the main artistic patrons of the 19th century. And this is Arkwright's first factory in Cromford, it's about 30 miles from Derby. Regarded as a wonder of the age, it's difficult for us today to appreciate the impact of this seven-storey structure, which operated 24 hours a day, lights burning in all the windows, an awe-inspiring symbol of the profound changes taking place in society. It led over the next hundred years to the number of people living in the countryside dropping dramatically from something like 75% um, of the workforce to just 25% as people moved to the towns uh, to work in factories. Wright, of course, has um, romanticised it by showing it by moonlight. And Wright was one of the first, if not the first, to convey the beauty of the Industrial Revolution and its power and spectacle in, in a sublime way. There was, of course, a darker side, as we see this today. The factories operated 24 hours a day. Children were worked dangerously long hours in terrible conditions. It was 20 years before William Blake coined the phrase dark satanic mills, normally thought to refer to these factories. Although I should add that some people think Blake was referring to the great churches of England as he was opposed to the established church. Portrait of Erasmus Darwin, who I mentioned was um, a member of the Lunar Society, like incidentally Richard Arkwright, who was also a member. Darwin was a doctor of medicine, a philosopher, inventor, poet and abolitionist, and regarded as one of the greatest of the Enlightenment thinkers. He was incidentally a close friend of another member of the Lunar Society I mentioned just now, Josiah Wedgwood. And it was Wedgwood's daughter Susanna who married Darwin's son Robert. And it was their son, who was the famous Charles Darwin, who married his first cousin Emma, who was the daughter of Josiah Wedgwood's son. This is um, a well-known portrait of the Tate, Sir Brooke Boothby, who was an amateur poet and philosopher, uh, again, another member of the Lunar Society. And he met the well-known philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau when he fled France and lived near to Boothby. And Boothby commissioned Wright to produce this portrait to show he followed Rousseau's philosophy. So we see him reclining by a stream in a wooded glade, 
which was actually um, a site near his property called Twenty Oaks. And it was here in the woods that he often met Rousseau for discussions. And Rousseau went there for peace and solitude to write. But here we see Boothby holding a leather-bound book. It's got the name, it's a bit hard to see, but it's got the name uh, Rousseau on the spine, referencing his interest in Rousseau's um, work. And the landscape itself can be seen as an interpretation or reference to Rousseau's idea that all of man's troubles and unhappiness derive from his removal from the natural world. And so the solution is to return to the, the peace of nature, which is what's being illustrated here. Again, another um, example of the peace of nature by moonlight. This is Dovedale by moonlight and shows Wright's extraordinary skill at rendering light and atmosphere. It's actually one of five paintings of the picturesque Dovedale Valley. And it reflects the Romantic period's fascination with moonlit scenes. They were very common. There was, um, they were very popular. I think because night transforms a, an everyday landscape into a mysterious place, and the moonlight subtly illuminates the scene, creating this feeling of secret spaces and places and this overall melancholy feel. Wright, actually, Wright gave one of these Dovedale paintings to Josiah Wedgwood and uh, two others he sold to uh, Brooke Boothby. I wanted to show you this because it's another type of painting by Wright. It's a illustration of a scene from a French novel. It tells the story of Miravan. It, it's called Miravan breaking open the tomb of his ancestors. Now Miravan was an Arab nobleman who came across a tomb of one of his ancestors and on the outside was written, in this tomb is a greater treasure than Croesus ever possessed. So driven by greed, he ordered it to be opened and then is struck dumb when he discovers inside is only a heap of dust and bones. And he realises in despair, which is what's shown here, that he's been tricked and will never enjoy eternal peace as he has disturbed the tomb of one of his ancestors. The hidden message here is that Miravan is a... Um, symbol for the scientists of the Enlightenment who, driven by curiosity, have the, da of the danger has led to their undoing because the romantic idea is that the, the age of Enlightenment and its investigation by scientists of nature should be tempered by our finer feelings. This painting, which is one of his emotionally charged paintings, it's showing a widow and her baby mourning the death of her soldier husband. It's called The Country Justice. Uh, sorry, it's, it's called The Dead Soldier, but it's based on a poem called The Country Justice. A well-known poem at the time. And I wanted to show it partly because to show that he didn't just paint science and industrial themes. He painted a wide range of different themes and in fact this painting became one of the most famous paintings during his lifetime. It was shown at the Royal Academy in 1789 to great acclaim. This is a similar painting, the Indian widow depicting a Native American widow gazing at the tomb of her deceased husband. Now, Wright didn't actually go to America, uh, but he read about, um, in a book called History of the American Indians by James Adair, he read about how a widow 
would keep vigil um, for her uh, dead husband. And that's what he's illustrating here. It was actually exhibited at what we believe was his first solo exhibition. And he, he held that exhibition, 1785 it was, the same year that he refused to become a Royal Ac Academician. He, he didn't actually need to become a Royal Academician because he was already a very well-known artist and he would have been one of those artists that the Royal Academy would have wanted to join their ranks. This painting was also very popular and incidentally he ha here has suppressed his customary prudery uh, by showing her bare breast which was is very unusual in a painting by Wright. Uh, and the other point I think to make about this is it was commonly thought at the time and fashionable to thought, think at the time that Native Americans were loyal supporters of the British and they worked together in their struggle against the uh, what were called the rebel Americans. This is a painting that I short, thought I'd show towards the end and he actually painted it when he went to Italy in 1773-74 um, and um, he exhibited the painting at the Society of Artists but um, it failed to sell I think because it's a bit too unusual. It, it's um story of an old man accosted by a skeleton in broad daylight. It was a known uh, story because it's a story uh, by Aesop. It's an Aesop fable. It's about a poor woodman so overwhelmed by the burdens of age and work that he lays down his bundle of sticks and calls upon death to ease his woes. To his surprise, death duly arrives armed with an arrow and the terrified woodman um, sort of changes his mind and politely asks death to help him pick up the bundle. The moral of the story is man any miseries will endure rather than seek from death a cure. So um, although it's a well-known story I think it probably was um, too uh, strange, too unusual um, an illustration for people to buy at the time so it it didn't actually sell in his lifetime but um, the, the death brings me towards the end of um, Wright's life with this one of his last self-portraits showing a mature Wright the same determination as we saw in the young Wright perhaps more wisdom in his eyes a testament to his growth as an artist and the the brushwork itself shows a more relaxed and confident artist. So one of the great artists of the 18th century often today associated solely with his artificially lit in interiors but I hope I've shown that there's a much wider scope to his work especially with the the drama and the power in which he represents the changing rapidly changing world at the time of the industrial revolution right at the beginning of that period please excuse the pun thank you for your time <laughs>